The way of the world. The familiar. The routine. Drifting toward the same ends. Heading off in the distance. As if there was no other way. But when you meet Christ, you realize there's a different direction. A guide that invites you on a counter-cultural pilgrimage. You find a sweet harmony in conversation, in step with him. You realize the blessing that it is to be near to him. He asks you to drop everything, to follow the path toward him. And while the walk is certainly not without its challenges, you are not left unattended. But it's easy to lose focus. It may not be intentional, but if you're not disciplined to move, the gap can widen and you'll become used to your callousness. He desires to have you close and you remember how pleasing it is. But the affairs of the world can become rather overwhelming and there are times when you feel trapped, times when you get preoccupied, distracted, pushed, pulled, bogged down. And you realize the instant that you're not actively moving toward him, you're moving away from him. Remember who called you to this journey and run to him. Ready, and then we'll get going. No. Okay. Hey, what? you just lay out their clothes because it takes me five minutes. Honey, That's perfect. Seriously.
Jack. Well, we're already late for church. Hey, Brian. Go get yourself dressed. Did you pick up my stuff from the dry cleaners? Uh, ooh. Oh. Make it. Okay, Jack, I'm gonna make you waffles. Can I have a sandwich? Yes, but you gotta make it by yourself. Jack! Okay. This is all I could find, and the zipper's broken. All right, I'll go grab a safety pin. I got the high score! <sighs> What are you doing? Daddy, I'm painting your fingernails. Well, that's great, sweetie, but go get dressed. Uh, uh. I need you to Ow. stay still. Okay. Honey. Everybody needs to eat. Here you go. I need one. Here you go. Okay, here you go. I forgot my shoes. Oh. Honey, we gotta go no. back. I wanna take off my shoes. Nobody's taking off their shoes. And I want everybody to understand that we're <gasps> oh, what? We made it. Yep. The way of the world, the familiar, the routine, drifting toward the same ends, heading off in the distance, as if there was no other way. But when you meet Christ, you realize there's a different direction, a guide that invites you on a counter-cultural pilgrimage. You find a sweet harmony in conversation, in step with him. You realize the blessing that it is to be near to him. He asks you to drop everything, to follow the path toward him. And while the walk is certainly not without its challenges, you are not left unattended. But it's easy to lose focus. It may not be intentional, but if you're not disciplined to move, the gap can widen, and you'll become used to your callousness. He desires to have you close, and you remember how pleasing it is. Father, in the name of Jesus, we give you the praise this beautiful day. Thank you, Lord, for bringing us all here today into the church and those joining online. Thank you, Father, for our lives. We pray that we will have a beautiful moment with you today. You will renew our hearts. You will bless us. You will bless the word that will be shared. And after service today, we will glorify your name. For in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Are you excited, people? Good morning. Let's worship. I was buried beneath my chain. It was 
It's my story. It's your story now. I need a rescue. My sin was heavy. But chains break out the weight of your glory. I need a shelter. I was an orphan. Now you called me a series in the bed. When I was broken.
God is the lion and the lamb at the same time. Come thou found of every blessing. Thou fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy grace, Jesus. Praise the mountain that I'm fixed upon, mountain of thy redeeming love. Psalms chapter 23, verse 5. The Lord says, He anointed my, ho- my head with oil. My cup runs over. My cup overflows. On the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, verse 4, everybody was filled with the Holy Spirit. 
not one person was left out. It's my belief that this morning God can fill us up all this morning. Brethren, just like Paul admonished the church in, I mean, in Romans 12 verse 1, he says, present your body as a living sacrifice, only acceptable unto God. I want you also to present your body as a living sacrifice. You provide the fire. I provide the sacrifice. I'm the living sacrifice. You provide the spirit, and I will open up your side. You provide the fire, I provide the sacrifice. You provide the spirit.
like your deed. and lambs again like we used to do in the Old Testament. Jesus, in fact, showed us the example by showing himself as a living sacrifice. Present your bodies as living sacrifice, people. Jesus, we just, uh, there's so many this morning that, God, if they were honest, they would just say they feel empty. They're struggling because they feel empty. They're struggling because there's, there's just so much has been going on in their life, and, and, and they're just trying to figure it out, and they're just praying for a miracle or trying to get an answer, and they're exhausted from their family situation. They're exhausted from their job situation. They're exhausted because of their own health situation. And so, Lord, we just pray that you would just encourage everybody this morning that's listening. God, that you would just give them, Lord, your peace, that your Holy Spirit would just fill their home, their, their car, wherever they're at, and just begin to replenish their soul. Just speak love in their life, God. Just give them the strength and the affirmation, God. Just give them the self-control and the perseverance. And just let all these things just begin to fuel into their soul. And God, you are going to work in their life. Amazing, great things. And they do not need to give up. They do not need to feel like they're forgotten. Because God, you are working for them. And I pray that you would just encourage them. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. Well, God bless you as you're seated this morning. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Good morning, Glad Tidings. We have uh, everybody listening this morning and on our broadcast. We always uh, appreciate that. We know, uh, you know, like... Majority of our church is faithfully watching us each Sunday. So they're, they're here with us from all over the place this morning. And so we're very, very, very glad to have you today. And uh, we, are, we are coming to the end of summer. I believe it. I am, I, I, I'm hoping because I, I'm ready to be done with hot, sunny days. I like, uh, I like rainy, cold, murky, foggy days. That's what I like. Yes, I can feel it coming. So I, I, I look forward to it. We got students that are, I got I to gotta, I gotta give a wave to some of my, my peeps. We got students that are coming back to campus. Michigan Tech students are going to be materializing here in the next couple of weeks. So we're excited about that. And uh, it's going to be a good year. And we are just going to tackle whatever challenges ahead our way. But we are hopeful and uh, just praying and, uh, you know, God still has things he wants to do, right? You know, just, just because of COVID-19, God doesn't stop working. And so we're excited to see what God's planned for us. And, and we're just going to enjoy 
the journey, even though it's a crazy journey. How many of you have lived a crazy journey? You can say, I've lived a crazy, no one's lived a crazy journey. I always thought you people were boring. Now I know for a fact you are. Well, maybe I'm one of the few. For unknown reasons, my life has been anything but normal. And I can only expect that the rest of my life will continue to be not normal. And so I just got to enjoy the journey because I, 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 I sure as heck don't always know where God's taking me. But I can just say, hey, you know what? God has a plan. God has a plan. So, so anywho, uh, shout out to all my ladies that were at the mother-daughter uh, camp out at Twin Lakes. And uh, how many had a good time there? It was, it was, it was fun fun and uh, it was good times there and, and let me tell you they they were they were pretty mean towards boys it was like girls only and boys couldn't show up and but I think they all had a great time and we we're we're thrilled and it looks like they got a, a barbecue coming up here was it on the 21st or something like that uh, at the Chassel Park Friday the 21st so some more girl power and uh, I may I may have to make another appearance just for barbecue you know it's awfully tempting, <laughs> awfully tempting. So, well, hey, uh, I'm going to jump into some of the scriptures this morning. So if you're listening to us, we are going to be in the Gospel of Matthew. And uh, we're going to be looking at Matthew at the very end in Matthew chapter 25, uh, verses 31 through 46. And so, again, I'm going to be speaking out of the New Living Translation. And so you guys can just, just you know, read along, join with us here. We're going to, we're going to be going there. So I, uh, I have a unique role here in this community, um, not just because I'm a pastor, but because I, I help out with hospice uh, as a chaplain. And I love that. And I love that because I really have a way of meeting the community. I get to meet people that all, I would never meet before, you know, and you get to come alongside people and I get to learn about their stories and their lives and their families. What did you do for a living? You know, when did you meet your husband? When did you meet your wife? How many kids, grandkids, great grandkids? You know, you just, you get to learn everybody's journey. You get to learn everybody's story. And it's interesting as I, as I come alongside families because I'm, I'm not there to be uh, a pastor, really. I'm not even there to proselytize them or share Jesus with them. I'm there to be a chaplain. I'm there to serve. So I, I have to uh, remember that because it's a different role than just being a pastor. And, and these people aren't like, you know, my people coming to my church to hear me preach or something like that. So when I, when I interact with people, I always say, well, what would you like from me? That's a good question, you know. Just, I'm the chaplain, what, what would you like for me? And, uh, and let them kind of articulate what, what they, they would like. And, and man, you know, you hear uh, just a wide spectrum uh, of answers. You know, some people are just like, well, really, I don't want anything from you. And, and you know, just being polite, I really don't want to see a chaplain. And so you just say, good enough. And, and that's the last time I ever see them. And then others would be like, well, I have uh, my own church and I have my own pastor coming visiting me. So I don't really feel like I need another. So I don't think I, I, I want anything from you. And I go, good enough. And then that's the last I ever see them. And then you have a few other people that are kind of in between. And there's a lot of people that will say, well, you know, I'm a spiritual person. And I would like for you to pray with me. Because I, I really want to go to heaven. And, um, and it's interesting that I, I have yet to encounter anybody who said, I really would like to go to hell. Uh, <laughs> it's the top of my bucket list. No, they, they usually say, I'd like to go to heaven. Uh, or they would say something interesting. Um, I have had many times people would say, I would like last rites. I would go, oh, Okay. Are you Catholic? No, no, but I would like last rites. I said, do you, do you want to be Catholic? No, I don't want anything to do with the Catholic Church, but I would like last rites. Well, last rites is a, is a part of the Catholic religion. And in order to receive last rites, you have to be baptized Catholic, and you have to receive those last rites from a priest. And so a lot of people 
They don't really know that, okay? They don't really belong to a religion or anything. So what they're really trying to say is, I really want to go to heaven. And I really want a relationship with God to know that, that I'm going to go to heaven. And, and, and they just know last rites is like the things people do right before they die so they can go to heaven. So that's what they're asking for. And so I have to say, well, you know, can I, can I talk with you about what that really is and what that means? I might be able to help you. I'm not Catholic. And if you don't want to be Catholic, you wouldn't want a priest anyway. Because if they do want a priest, I can actually call one and they'll come. But if not, let's talk about what does it mean to go to heaven? And we'll have those kinds of conversations. And so, I, you know, I find people want to go to heaven. And not most people that I, I meet in hospice don't really have a religion. In fact, sometimes they do, but they don't really know it. Like, I remember one family, a wonderful family, ended up being an amazing family. I really, really liked them. And uh, when I met them, the first words of their mouth was, we're Methodist. Uh, oh, good to know. The second words are out of their mouth. We have a question for you. And I said, well, sure, I'm here to help. How, what was your question? What is a Methodist? <laughs> I go, oh, okay. Well, uh, let me kind of describe to you what Methodism is. You know, did you, were you raised? Or well, our dad was born in a Methodist church. You remember going to it in Sunday school. And I think our grandparents had been Methodists. And so, you know, we claim that as our tribe, you know. It's, it's, it's like, okay, okay. So people have all sorts of questions and thoughts when they think about heaven. And they think about as they're dying, am I going to go to heaven? And I want to make sure I have some kind of confirmation or at that moment that, that I'm okay and I'm going to be okay or, or, or something like that. And so I have the liberty and, and, and privilege of having conversations with people that, that can be really, really good sometimes. And I'm always happy to do that. That's a part of it. But it's great learning what people really think about who goes to heaven and who doesn't go to heaven. And so what's really interesting is we're about ready to read a parable and Jesus liked to talk or tell stories. And that's what a parable is. It's a story. He uses it to illustrate a point or a truth. And so Jesus told lots of stories. And he was really a good storyteller, one of the best like ever. And so we have all these stories in the, in, in the Gospels. And we're going to be learning some of these stories here over the next Sundays. But this morning, I wanted to kind of focus on one story when Jesus basically says, sheep go to heaven and goats go to hell. So are you a sheep or are you a goat? And that's like, that is a weird question. I've never thought of myself as a sheep or a goat. None of those things. So are you a sheep or are you a goat? Let's go ahead and read the story together. In Matthew chapter 25, verses 31 uh, through 46. Now this is Jesus talking. And he says, when the Son of Man, and that's, he's referring to himself. That's one of the names of Jesus that he refers to himself as sometimes. He says, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Now, Jesus is talking about the end of the world. Jesus is talking about the very end of the end of the end, okay? And so he's going to come to this world at the very, very end and all of his glory and all of his power and all of his majesty. In verse 32, it says, all the nations, both Jew and Gentiles, will be gathered in his presence and he will separate people as a shepherd, a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And so this is the parable. This is the story is going to be about a shepherd. And a lot of the shepherds, their herds uh, would have sheep, and then they would also have some goats, and the herds would get kind of intermixed during the day. And so one of the things that a shepherd would do often at night is when he would come to bed down his animals, or if he was going to provide any special feed or, or, or whatever, he would separate. Right before bedtime, he'd, he'd separate the sheep. Okay, they're going to go to bed over here. And then he'd separate the goats. Okay, I'm going to put the goats over here. And then, and then they would go to bed. But during the day, they were kind of intermixed. The sheep and the goats, they were just kind of all over one another. You know, it was one big massive group of critters. And so the shepherd would separate these things. And so Jesus is saying, that's what's going to happen when I come. At the very end of the world very end of the age, I'm going to come back to earth and all the nations are going to be before me and I'm going to separate them. 
I'm going to separate the people that are the sheep, and I'm going to separate the people that are the goats. And so and then he goes on and he explains what the sheep are. And so verse 33, he says, and he will place the sheep at his right hand and the goats at his left. Verse 34, then the king will say to those on his right, come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger and you invited me into your house and I was naked and you gave me clothing. I was sick and you cared for me and I was in prison and you visited me. Verse 37. Then the righteous ones will reply, Lord, when did we ever see you hungry and feed you? Or thirsty and give you something to drink? Or a stranger and show you hospitality? Or naked and give you clothing? When did we ever see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will say, I tell you the truth, when you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you were doing it to me. Verse 41, and then the king will turn to those on his left, that being the goats, and he will say, away with you, you cursed ones, into eternal fire prepared for the devil and his demons. For I was hungry and you didn't feed me. I was thirsty and you didn't give me a drink. And I was a stranger and you didn't invite me into your home. I was naked and you didn't give me clothing. I was sick and in prison and you didn't, didn't visit me. Then they will reply, Lord, when did we ever see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and not help you? And he answered, I'll tell you the truth. When you refuse to help the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you were refusing to help me. And they will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous will go away into eternal life. So that is the parable of the sheep and the goats. Jesus was talking about sheep and the goats. And how do you know when somebody is going to heaven and how do you know when somebody is going to hell. And so this is one of those illustrations where Jesus says, well, I know, I know exactly. I know, I know sometimes more than people know. One of the interesting, surprising lessons in this story is that the sheep had no idea that they had ever actually served Jesus. They're like, well, we, we never realized that we were actually helping you, they, you know, that you were paying attention. You were recognizing when we were feeding the poor. You were recognizing when we were helping the sick or, or clothing the naked or visiting people in prison. We didn't realize, Jesus, that that was like you were paying attention to that and that was going to be remembered and that you were going to you know, record that and that was going to be like the difference in how you're separating us. And likewise, the people that didn't do any of those things are like, Jesus, when did we ever miss that moment? I mean, like, when did we fail to feed you? When did we fail to help you? And, and Jesus says, whenever you failed to do it, the least of these, you failed to do it to me. And so both groups, the sheep and the goats, are both honestly a little confused because they're like, they don't realize the things that they were doing or the things that they weren't doing, God was actually paying attention to. You see, some people will decide to do as many good things as they can because they think, think that they're like earning their way to heaven or like building karma. It's like, if I do all the good things as I can, they'll like cancel out the bad things. And then when God reviews my life, he'll see I'll have more good than bad and then I'll go into heaven. And so they, they like attempt to like, okay, I'm gonna do a good deed of the day. What's that gonna be? I'm gonna do the good deed of the week. What's that gonna be? I'm gonna do something crazy for, for, for like 2000, 2020 on Thanksgiving Day, I'm going to go to a homeless shelter and help serve out turkey and stuff. I'm going to do something. And they're, but they're motivated is they want to do good so that their good is more than their bad. And they are planning on God watching and seeing what they're doing. In fact, sometimes some people will do good things just because it makes them feel better about themselves. The real motive behind what they're doing isn't actually to help other people. The real motive is actually to help themselves. And so there's other people that, that can say, well, you know, 
uh, we just, we belong to a religion. We, we, we were born, we were baptized as a baby, or we were always a part of this religious thing. And so we have a, a church membership card and we have a, a necklace with a cross on it. So therefore, we're like, good, right? You know, we, we, when God looks at us, he'll see our church membership. And so we'll get to go to heaven. But Jesus in the story explains that, that neither of those groups None of that makes sense here because what Jesus is saying is the sheep have already accepted Christ as their Lord at some point in their life. And Jesus actually changed their nature. The very person of who they were changed when they accepted Jesus as their Lord. Peter says in a different way, he says, and because God's glory and excellence has been given to us in these precious promises... There are promises that enable you to share his divine nature and escape the world's corruption caused by human desires. And what Peter is trying to say is, is God's promise of salvation. And when you accept Jesus into your life to be your Lord and you serve him, the Holy Spirit will actually change you and your inside will change. And you'll actually start becoming like God. You'll take on his nature. And then what will happen is that you will naturally start serving others. And you won't even be thinking that God's paying attention. You won't even be motivated to be like, okay, this is my good deed for the day. No, it's just instinct. In fact, it's such an instinct that you don't even pay attention to what you're doing. You don't even think what you're doing is special. You don't even think what you're doing is noticeable. You just do it because it's natural. It's natural because you belong to God and God is in your heart, in your life. And he's changed you so you don't even realize that it's natural anymore. But Jesus sees your nature and he can tell how a sheep behaves, and he can tell how a goat behaves, and he looks at the nature of the sheep, and he says, I have seen all that you have done, even when you don't realize it, you were actually serving me because it was in your nature to serve. And then he looks at the goat, and you can say, you think it's not fair that I'm holding you accountable to something you didn't even realize was being measured. Like, when was the moment we failed you? And Jesus says, it's not about the moment that you failed me. It's that your nature is that of a goat. Your nature is that of a wicked person. Your nature is not one of my children. You, you want me to give you an accounting of list the moments that we failed you, therefore we don't go to heaven. And I'm telling you, you failed me because your heart is wrong. Not because you missed an opportunity to feed a homeless person. Not because you, you didn't do enough good deeds in one day. You failed me because your heart is wrong. And so your very nature is wrong. And you aren't doing the things that I am all about because you aren't one of my kids. My Holy Spirit's not in you. And so you, you blow it. You blow every opportunity. Because you're a goat. You're a goat. That's it. Jesus separates people like their sheep and like their goats. People think of, of what they do so much is what matters to God. And it's not that those things don't matter. It's what is behind the deeds that you do. The Galatians tells us that the fruit of the Holy Spirit is love and joy and peace and patience, and kindness, and goodness, and faithfulness, and gentleness, and self-control. These are the very characteristics of Jesus' personality and his entire heart. And when these things are in our life, our nature changes. And we don't have to be asked to serve. We just respond to the need whenever we're around it, and we don't even realize it. We just do what we do because it's who we are, which is why Jesus says, that's why you're a sheep, and that's why I know you're a sheep. I know exactly who you are because I know that you're me, me in you, and I see my very nature living out in you because I can't walk by a hurting person without helping. I can't pass a starving person without feeding 
I can't ignore somebody in prison without visiting them. I know I can't do that and you can't do that either because you love me and my spirit is in you. You are a sheep. And then for all the goats out there, you're just a goat. You're a goat trying to be a sheep. You're a goat who, who has under the same, same shepherd, has the same herd, and you're around the sheep all day long. And you, you keep thinking, well, if I do this, if I do that, or if I have this, or I have that, and you keep thinking really important thoughts about yourself and how wonderful you are and how impactful you are. And, and what you're really doing is you're just reinforcing your own pride and, and you're just filling yourself with your, these own things. And, and everything that you're motivated is, is, is to be a sheep, but you're actually not a sheep. You're a goat. You're a goat. And then when Jesus says, you know what? You're not a sheep, you're a goat. You're like, what, 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 when? When I was growing up, we had, uh, I had multiple neighbors around me that had livestock, which was kind of rare in central Illinois because we had nothing but black soil. So we had endless corn and soybean fields. But I was around where there was some clay soil and some, a little bit of timber ground. And so there was some pasture and there were cows and there were animals. And uh, so one neighbor on the one side of me, they had this, this, this herd of cows, about 30 cows, you know. And it was like a little cow-calf operation. And they had uh, got a horse dumped on them. Sometimes people want to get rid of a horse. It's old or it's, I don't know. It's, it's, I don't know. It's a dumb horse. Nobody likes it. They can't ride it. I don't know. But they you just get dumped. You get a horse dumped on him. And so this horse was named Bill. And they got Bill dumped on him. So they just put Bill in the pasture with the cows. And for like the next 10 years, uh, Bill lived with the cows. And so as a kid growing up, uh, we always knew Bill as the horse that thinks he's a cow. He doesn't know he's a horse because... He's the only horse with all the cows. So we had Bill, the horse that thinks he's a cow. And so that is what happens with goats sometimes when they're around the sheep. They can say, we have all of these things. And yet Jesus looks at them and says, yeah, but your heart is far from me. My nature is not in you, so my spirit is not in you. And as much as you think you're a sheep, you're a goat. You're a goat. And the only way to really know that you're a sheep isn't by all the good things that you do. The only way to know is if you've really, really committed your life to me, to be the Lord of your life, to be your master, to be your boss, to serve me. And then obediently you just say, God, change my heart. And he does. And you ask for forgiveness for your sins. And every time you blow it you, you fail, you, you, you receive God's forgiveness and mercy. But you just dedicate yourself to serving him. And when you serve him, your nature is to serve everybody else. Whether you realize that's what you're doing or not. See, motives are powerful. And how can you tell a person's motive? Jesus can. Jesus looks right into the heart. Jesus dissects your very thoughts. Jesus knows every, every feeling, every thought, every memory, every motive of your life. And it's as simple as a shepherd telling the difference between a sheep and a goat. Jesus knows those that really love him and those that just want to be a part of the club. That's the difference. That's the difference. So I hope we have nothing but sheep in the house. If I'm surrounded by a bunch of sheep, can you say, Mah. I hope so. I hope so. Well, hey, will you stand with me this morning? We're going to pray. And as I'm praying this morning, uh, you know, we have so many people that are absolutely listening to us. And, and I want to give you an invitation uh, because, you know, the live stream is kind of like a one-way communication where I'm just like, hey, you know, always talking and you, you're, you're like listening. But when you hear a message like this, this is a moment where you, you may need to talk to me because you may be like, I don't know if I'm a sheep or a goat. You may be like, I want to be a sheep. I'm ready to actually serve Jesus in my life. I know I've not had that in my life. 
I may have been a part of a religion, I may have been baptized or something, and, but I know I haven't been living it, and I know, I know God has more for me, and I really want that. And I want to be able to help you. I want to be able to pray with you. I want to be able to counsel you. I want to make sure that you, you, you know that you're a sheep, that God can make you a sheep. And I don't want to miss that opportunity. So I want to invite you to reach out to our church. If you're listening to this broadcast, if you go on our church website, you'll also see our contact us at gladtidingsag.org uh, thing. And you can email the church. And would you, would you do me that? If you would like to have a conversation with me about, about Jesus, about prayer, and sheep and goats, Email us, and I would be very happy to get in touch with you this week. And I think that would be wonderful and amazing. And so please send us a message, and we'll be more than happy to follow up with you. Well, let's pray this morning. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much that you love us enough. God, that you don't just leave us like Bill, where we think we're, we think we're a cow, but we're actually a horse. No, no. You love us enough to be able to tell us when we're a goat. You love us enough to tell us that we're missing something. You love us enough to tell us when our life isn't right. God, you're not trying to hide your truth from us. You're trying to love us, reveal yourself to us, speak to us in a way that we can understand. But Lord, we just know we're stubborn. And so God, we just say we give you permission to speak in a way we can understand. Speak to our minds. Speak to our heart. Jesus, we want to, you to always be able to speak to us. And Lord, for some of us, we serve and we don't expect anyone to notice because that's not why we're doing it. But sometimes serving is exhausting. Sometimes serving is tiring. Sometimes being a parent is overwhelming. Sometimes being a grandparent is overwhelming. Sometimes just trying to help other people can be so tiring. And for everybody that's tired because they're serving, and we just pray, Jesus, that you would just bless them, that they would know that they are loved, and they would know how much you appreciate what they're doing. And God, you're gonna help them to serve in a healthy way. And you're not calling them to burn out. You're not calling them to destroy their lives through serving. Not at all. But you are going to show them the things that they can say yes to and the things that it's okay to say no to. And they're still going to have a heart of serving. And so, God, we just pray that you would bless our struggling servants. Lord, we just ask these things in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen, amen. Well, God bless you this morning. Thank you for joining us and have an amazing week. Blessings. Bye-bye.